Thank you very much. And thank you very much to Ted for having me here. I'm excited to be speaking to you. So as you know, I'm the author of a novel that uses fantasy to teach history. And you might think that that is kind of an odd combination. It is the ultra real combined with the ultra imaginary. But it actually arises out of my particular perspective on what history is. I think that history is a series of stories of fantasy and magic and wonder and weird quirky events and sex and adventure. That is what history is to me. And part of what I'm here to do is to give you some of that perspective on history, to tell you why you might want to think about reading history just in your spare time, just enjoying history for its own sake, and why you might even consider a few years down the road when you're in college becoming a history major. Um, in other words, I'm going to tell you about the magic of history. And it, it, to break it down, really there's a couple things that I want to explain. First of all, we're going to talk about what history actually is. Because history is a somewhat misunderstood topic. Um, so it's going to be a little bit, possibly a little bit of a surprise when I explain what I mean when I say history. And then get into that other question of why history is so interesting. What, what is compelling about history? What is dramatic about history? And the way I'm going to illustrate these points to you is probably not surprising for somebody who thinks that history is stories. I'm going to tell you a bunch of little short stories from history um, that illustrate these points. So let's begin. Let's talk about what history is. When I was in college, I was a history major. And I remember going on a walk with a, a girlfriend who was an English major. And she said she didn't understand why anybody would major in history. She didn't understand why anybody would just study this thing, which basically there's this record of stuff that happened in the past. And you look it up, and you remember it. And that's history. Unlike what she was doing, you know, reading Jane Austen and figuring out what was Jane Austen really trying to say and what was this all about and why did Elizabeth Bennet go to that tea party? Um, and it, it actually took me a little while to figure out what the answer to this question was. At first I was a little embarrassed. Well, why am I majoring in this obvious stuff? The answer is that that her assumption and many people's assumption about history that it's something that you can look up is actually not right. The textbooks that we read that tell us history are actually not history. They're not authoritative. You read all this stuff that happened and we think, OK, this is it. This is the record of the past. It's in my textbook. The teacher assigned it. It must be right. But in fact, textbooks are just a series of somebody's interpretations a very sketchy evidence. Because most of history that we're studying is stuff that nobody alive ever saw. And even when they did, there's all these conflicting opinions. So where do we get history? Most obviously from written records. People leave records throughout much of history um, of what's happening. Problem is, records are written by liars. Records are written by fools. Records are written by people with political agendas to do with their own time. Maybe they're writing about their own time 700 years ago when they have an agenda. They want something to be achieved. Records are written by people who just don't know what they're talking about. They're wrong. They're written with somebody's narrow and particular perspective. So this not that's really an authoritative source. Also, history comes from a lot of other sources that are even less clear than records written by liars and fools. History comes from. Artifacts like broken swords and bits of gold, ruined buildings, records of climate change in the ice in Antarctica. Not really. Yeah, no, in, in the Arctic. No, Antarctica. That's right. No, no, the Arctic. I was wrong. Greenland. That's where you get the records of ice. Anyway, there's all these different sources. And it's really not clear what they say. And so the job of the historian and the job of the person who just reads history for fun because it's so interesting is to read these little bits of data you get from all these different places and figure out what was going on. Let me give you a couple of story examples of what I'm talking about. The Roman Empire fell in the 400s AD, common era, CE. AD and CE. CE has become more sort of politically correct. And ever since then, it has been well known that the Roman Empire was 
overthrown by invading barbarians. Barbarians like the Huns and the Goths and the Franks, all these barbarian tribes invaded the Roman Empire and overthrew it. And that's the story. That's the textbook answer why the Roman Empire fell. And it's pretty clear and pretty simple. All these barbarians invaded. The problem is, as historians have looked at records from the Roman Empire, they have found all of these references to emperors inviting barbarian tribes in. Please come into the empire. That doesn't fit the story. They also find all these references to governors of Roman provinces who were barbarians. Barbarian kings and warlords were appointed to govern provinces. So how did the Roman Empire fall due to barbarian invasion? And the, the truth is, modern historians now don't think that's the story. The story we tell now is that the emperors were getting weaker and weaker and weaker due to other problems. And they had trouble maintaining a decent military. And they invited these barbarians in. Come in and help us. We will give you, we will give you land. We will give you money. We'll, you become the army. And what just happened is as the empire got weaker and weaker and, and the, the use of barbarian soldiers just didn't solve the problem, these barbarians who'd been given bits of territory and made part of the em empire just stopped taking orders from the empire. They just stopped listening to the emperor. And the empire was essentially gone. So the Roman Empire didn't fall. It sort of dissolved. That's an example of detective work. That's an example of reinterpreting history, of looking at the sources and finding that they say different things than you think they're going to. Let me give you another even, even weirder example. Anthropologists and historians have wondered for a long time how it is, well, when it was that we started wearing clothing. Animals don't wear clothing. We, we descend from a long line of, of ape-like creatures. When did we start wearing clothing? The answer is, it is wet, relatively well believed, about 72, 73, 75,000 years ago. How can we possibly know this? We're obviously beyond the time of written records. This is distant prehistory. We know it from lice. We know it from the genes of lice. Turns out there's two types of lice that prey on people. There's head lice, there's clothes lice, and they're related to each other. And genetic analysis has shown that these two species diverged from each other about 72,000 years ago. So the conclusion is these lice preyed on humans, probably lived in our hair for thousands of years, and then we created this new environment for them. Some of them migrated and evolved into a different species. That's history. Actually, that's also anthropology. It's prehistory. I'm cheating a little bit. But that's what's so fascinating, is uncovering stories like these. That's what history is about, stories like these. So OK, I've given, a, I hope, a different perspective than you might have had on what history is. Let's talk about why you might want to read history. And I am not saying that you should all become historians. I am not a historian. I'm a lawyer. I'm an amateur historian. I'm a lawyer who writes history books on the side or, or fantasy that teaches history. Um, and I'm not saying you have to become a historian, but I think it's a great subject. And I want to tell you why you might enrich your lives by reading it on your own and possibly even majoring in it in college. I'm going to give you three reasons. Reason number one is what I said at the beginning. History is a series of magical stories. It's magic. It's like fantasy. And let me give you sort of a personal perspective on that, on how I came to be a history reader, and in fact, a reader at all. When I was in fourth grade, they couldn't get me to read novels. You're not supposed to read novels and enrich yourself. And you guys actually probably were beyond the novel reading stage for many years by the time you hit fourth grade. But people were a little bit dumber uh, in my time. Um, and fourth grade was when they were trying to really get you to read novels, and I wouldn't do it. I found them boring and uninteresting. The Hardy Boys just bored me. Eventually, my mom bought me The Hobbit. And I read The Hobbit, and that led me to become a reader. Loved that. Took off. I started reading fantasy novels. From fantasy novels, I discovered there's another source of interesting fantasy called mythology. I discovered Greek myths and Norse myths, and I started reading those. And from there, I discovered that there's actually some interesting stories that one might read about the people who told those myths, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Norse, not so ancient North, the Norse. And suddenly, I was reading history. The transition was never meaningful to me. I was reading stories of knights and kings and slaves and priests and monsters, maybe imaginary monsters. 
And it was the same. It didn't matter whether I was reading a fantasy or a history. And that was, that's the perspective that I come at this from, and I think that that's valid. Let me give you some examples from, from history of how history is mythical and magical. First of all, history is a series of mythical tales. Probably a lot of you have heard the tale, the Greek myth of the Minotaur. The Minotaur was a monster with the body of a man, huge powerful man, and the head of a bull. And he lived in a labyrinth on the island of Crete. And young Greeks were brought, this is, this is, this is the Bronze Age, this is the age of myth for the Greeks. Young Greeks were, were brought to the labyrinth and thrown in to be eaten by the monster. One of the, one of the famous tales of Greek mythology. You know what? It's true. It's real history. Now, it's not perfectly literally true. I'd actually like to just say it's true and walk off the stage and leave you wondering, but no. It's essentially true. What they think is that the people of Crete had a, a more developed, more sophisticated civilization than the people of Greece, their neighbors in the Bronze Age. And their palace at Knossos was an enormous, immense place, which from the point of view of the unsophisticated Greeks who had smaller buildings looked like a labyrinth. It looked like a maze. The Cretans were also into the sport of bull jumping, which may have been a predecessor of modern bullfighting. Bull jumping, an acrobat actually jumps over a charging bull. You grab the horns, flip over. There's amazing, beautiful murals in Crete showing this happening. And they think what happened is they brought young Greeks to the bull ring at the great labyrinthine palace for, to, to, to jump in this, uh, uh, to, to compete in this athletic contest, possibly against their will. There were possibly tributes, um, like in the Hunger Games. <laughs> and that's where the myth comes from. It's true. Let me give you another example. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. You all know the story. Some scholars think that Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is based, based on real mythology, the story of the Norse Germanic goddess Freya, white-skinned, beautiful goddess who encounters some hideous little dwarves and acquires from them a powerful necklace uh, that, she, uh, that she takes away from them and uses. Possibly Snow White and the Seven Dwarves have this real, this real antecedent. History is also sexy. Very good romance stories. One of the most sexy romantic characters you find in history is Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, this was a lady of the Middle Ages um, the Duchess of Aquitaine, medieval Europe, France. Um, and the, I mean, if you want to read a, a sexy, about a sexy, fascinating, brilliant woman, this is it. She marries the king of France. Um, she goes on crusade. She cheats on the king of France with a variety of people, including one of his lords, uh, the Count of Anjou. Then she also cheats on the king of France with the 18-year-old son of the Count of Anjou who she ultimately divorces the king for and marries. He, incidentally, becomes king of England, which he had a claim to. And, and they together are the parents of Richard the Lionhearted and the evil Prince John, you may know, from Robin Hood. Very sexy, interesting character. Another sort of interesting sex-related story from history. Genghis Khan, the great conqueror. The great conqueror, Genghis Khan, they believe that something like 8% of the people in a certain region of East Asia have his Y chromosome. That means he and his sons were busy. <laughs> History is also a source of stories of horror. The emperors, uh, the first Chinese emperor is said to have put all the people who dug his fantastic, glorious tomb into the tomb, killed them and buried them there. They may still be buried there. One of my favorite horror stories from history is the story of the Cadaver Synod. In the 800s, the pope dug up the body of the former pope, put him in clothes, put him in a chair, and put him on trial for crimes. <laughs> Yelled at him, found him guilty, cut off three fingers as a punishment, threw the body away. <laughs> this actually happened. Actually, I shouldn't say, I just finished telling you. We don't know what actually happened. We think this actually happened. So history is a story of all, all these stories of wonder and magic and horror and weird stuff. That's one reason why you might enjoy it. Another reason is there's so much knowledge that you gain about what's happening in the real world. You gain an ability to get a perspective when people tell you things about history that shape the real world. One of the things that you will probably hear in college if you haven't all already is that the United States is like the Roman Empire. And what do you know about the Roman Empire? 
it fell. And we are falling. We are declining. They love this in Europe. You hear this all the time. As somebody who loves the Roman Empire and reads a lot about it, I'm here to tell you I don't think it's true. I don't think it's true because the Roman Empire's big problem was they had endless borders to defend. They needed all those barbarians to help them. We don't have endless borders. We have largely water borders. And where we do have land borders, we have two neighbors that aren't as strong as we are and don't have any particular incentive to invade. Even more particularly, the Roman Empire, probably really their problem, probably really their issue, was they had a terrible system for picking a leader. Almost, almost constant civil wars, disputes about who was going to be emperor. Remember 2000, Bush v. Gore? Everything went haywire. We couldn't figure out who won the electoral vote in Florida. No fists were thrown. It was all solved in the courts. So history gives you that perspective to be a little bit calmer. Let me give you another perspective from history. You will almost constantly hear people say throughout your life that this is the worst of all times. People are more corrupt, more selfish, corporate greed, blah, 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 blah. If you read history, you find that people in every time throughout history think that. Go back 1,000 years, this is the worst time ever. Go back 10,000 years, well, we don't have records, probably. Almost any period you go to, things are, things are as bad now as they ever were. So it gives you a little perspective to understand that, and maybe, maybe think our time isn't so bad. Final reason you might want to consider history as a source of fun. The more you know, the more you can be surprised. History is full of all these surprising factoids. It is so surprising. Did you know that the founding fathers of the United States, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, etc., had the same accents as the British aristocracy that they were fighting against, the generals like Cornwallis? Even weirder, that accent, the way they spoke back then, was more similar to how you and I speak now in the United States than how they speak in England today. We sound more like the English aristocrats and the English people in general of 200 years ago than the English do. That's just weird. It's because the, the English, English, the language in England changed a little bit faster than it did here from a shared start. Another interesting factoid, just a surprise from history. Enjoy The Hobbit, Tolkien's writing. One of the most fascinating things you get in all these stories of fantasy is a world full of different kinds of people. You've got elves, dwarves, hobbits, orcs. That's actually real. There really was a time when the world was like that, believe it or not, in distant prehistory, in the old Stone Age. We shared the planet with, there actually were hobbits. There's a creature called Homo floriensis, three foot tall. They nickname it the hobbit. This was a human-like creature, but not one of us that we shared the world with. There were Neanderthals, large, powerful, possibly very smart. There was Homo erectus, also large, powerful, probably fast, not very smart. And there were several others. This is real. We shared the world with these people. Another final surprising factoid, this is the one that just blows me away. You know the Marquis de Lafayette? Hear the name Lafayette. This is one of the great heroes of the American Revolution, the French nobleman who came to fight with George Washington in this noble cause and became one of our generals and helped us defeat the British. Dashing French soldier, also a hero of the French Revolution. He was not handsome. Can you believe that? I mean, this guy, this is, he has to be handsome. You get the description of the market. Look him up. Google him. You find portraits. He was not remotely handsome. <laughs> this shocks me. So history is the source of all these surprises. And again, as I said, the more you know, the more sort of prejudices and assumptions you have about history, the more likely you are to be surprised. So to sum up, let me say a couple things about going forward with history. It turns out it is actually possible, despite everything I've said, to make history boring. You will find teachers and professors who succeed at this task. I had a professor. I went to Berkeley undergrad, and I majored in history. The beginning of a course, the professor sort of, he opened his notes, and he looked down at them. He started announcing the class, and he looked at them and said, and this is not a very good course. I looked back down, and he just kept going. And it's true. He made it boring. So you will find people who make it boring. And there will be boring history classes. I'm sure not any boring teachers in this school district. But you'll find them out there. Your job then, when you find history being made boring, is to make it interesting. Find the Eleanors of Aquitaine. Find the interesting stories. Find the weird stuff. 
Write your papers about that. Find the human stories to write your papers. Find the human stories, the fascinating stories, the surprises for your final exams, your presentations. Make your classes interesting. I also encourage you to read history just for fun, as I do. Historical novels, narrative histories. And incidentally, you want to look at narrative histories where they take a period or a person and make a story out of it rather than a sort of textbook outline format. Narrative histories makes history fun. So I encourage you to read history just for fun, just for the enrichment of your soul. In that way, you will discover the magic of history. Thank you very much.